Welcome to Burrows and Burbs with hosts John Engel and Roberto Cabrera. Over the next hour, you're going to learn some insider knowledge that will help you overcome and strategize in the cutthroat world of real estate. Now, here are your hosts, John and Roberto. Welcome, everybody. Burrows and Burbs, episode 109, the design build episode. I'm your host, John Engel, and I'm joined by my co host, Roberto Cabrera. Say hello. Hello, everybody. How are you from Manhattan? He's coming to you from world headquarters on the Upper West Side of New York City, center of the universe. And every Thursday, we bring you insightful conversations about the national real estate landscape, exploring the boroughs, burbs, and any place that could be of interest to New Yorkers. Today, we have some incredible guests lined up, Hillary Kaplan and Miriam Silver Verga of the firm Mimi and Hill. Let's see if I can pull it up on the screen. There they are. Mimi and Hill, who are, I guess, designers by, by trade, who got good at organizing the whole project. And we're gonna hear more about that. We also have Brinton Brosius. Say hello, Brinton. Hi, everybody. And this is uh, his firm by the same name, Brinton Brosius. We have Scott Hobbs. This is Scott Hobbs' website at Hobbs Inc. Third generation builder. No designers are allowed in the building. Just building <laughs> 65 years. Maybe finally getting the hang of it. Before we begin, first, our sponsor. Let me see if I can. Oh, I know I screwed that up. Let's see. Um, Grace, sharegracefarms.com. You can buy fabulous cookie, uh, coffees and teas at sharegracefarms.com. And it supports the design for freedom movement, which is to eliminate forced labor in the building materials supply chain. So when you buy their teas and coffees, you you are helping their design for freedom initiative. And with no further ado, I'll stop sharing the screen. Uh-oh, I lost all of my screens. There we go. <laughs> am I sharing screens? I don't think I am. No, with no we further can see ado, you. You look great. Roberto, tell me what you think about the design build episode. What do you think we're going to talk about today? Well, I think there's going to be a little bit of conflict here because, uh, I, first of all, we need to define between designer and decorator first because I know that uh, the contractors probably get a little queasy when they start walking down the path towards them. Um, and, uh, and I'm really interested to hear the different philosophies here. I mean, I have my own, but I, I'm looking to, I'm open-minded for change. We've got designers, we've got decorators, we've got architects, we've got pure builders like Scott Hobbs, Hillary and Miriam, what is Mimi and Hill? Well, we began as decorators. We began our business 12 years ago um, as two um, good friends and good business partners um, who had great taste and would bring our great taste to projects and think that was more than enough. And it was to a degree. And I think that um, the design industry has evolved and we have evolved and we've made lots of mistakes along the way. And one of the ways we've always self-corrected is by leveling up and hiring up. And that's just been our philosophy. We began as decorators. We are now a almost 20 person design firm. Um, and the reason we became a design firm is because of the partnerships we enjoyed with builders and the kind of experience we wanted to give the builder, the architect, and the client. And we felt that that being decorators on our own wasn't giving the kind of experience that we felt these big projects warranted. And so we have personally leveled up so that our deliverables are much clearer and um, we're able to really communicate with the builder really effectively with a set of professionals that make that easy and I, I think a great experience, but I'll let the, the builders who we've worked with. So you've <laughs> worked with Scott Hobbs and Hobbs Inc. in the past and with Britton Brosius currently, I believe. Yes. So when we worked with Scott, it was kind of the beginning of people reaching out to us as a design firm. And 
honestly, we worked very closely with an architect who stepped in and did a lot of the things that we can do in-house now. Um, and um, it wasn't quite the experience that we wanted for our client, yeah. even though the end result was beautiful, the experience wasn't what we wanted to give. And Brenton now has the benefit of working with our very elite team who are able to give the exact kind of experience and deliverables that we think a client and a project of those sizes warrant. Brenton, tell me about what it's like working with mm. Mimi and Hill 2.0. Mm, it's great. <laughs> it's great. So, you know, as Scott will attest, we so much appreciate a firm that is organized and understands construction. If you if you work with a with a design firm that's more decorating oriented, they don't really understand what you need and you have to constantly ask for things from them as opposed to a Mimi and Hill that's out ahead of things and understands all the critical decisions that tie back to a schedule. So they make our job so much easier. Um, and I would add, you know, in the in the design and the building, it, it's hard to do one thing right. So when you try to combine these things, I think you know there's this there's this inherent watering down of the of the result. So, you know, I was an architect. Now I'm a builder. I, you know, I'm just trying to get this portion right. So so let me, so it seems like decorating is checkers, designing is chess. But then it also seems like you're a, you're kind of a middleman between the architect and the construction. Yes or no or yeah. And are we, you step yeah. then? Are you beginning to step on people's toes? No, I think you. I think you need a team that can come together. You need the architect. You need the designer. You need a good builder. You know, you certainly need a good homeowner. But you need that collaboration. And no matter what, there's an evolution of a plan, and there's an interpretation of a plan. And no set of plans can really be that much of a gospel that leads you through the project you're going to have to work together and work through details so you need people who have the experience and understanding and have done that stuff before i think i would add one thing i think that that concept of a plan being evolutionary is so important and i think that's what um, homeowners are missing when they when they go to their architect and they get the plan they're like great that's done and for a lot of architects, it is done at that point. And I'm sure there's always architects that are different than that. But for a lot of the firms we deal with, once the plan is goes to, through building and it's approved, they kind of step away. And the evolution becomes the job of yes. our team. We're the ones who are you know, providing things like updated lighting schedules that are based on actual site conditions, not like wishful thinking on paper. So we're constantly updating a lighting plan and that's not something most architects are doing. Now, there may be architects that do that. So I don't, I'm not saying it's everyone. No but, hate mail, please. Yeah, <laughs> but we're the ones that are, that are, that are showing the evolved plan. Um, so that, that is typically where we step in. And what's very hard for our clients to understand is once they paid for a lighting plan, they don't understand the need for the 17 more lighting plans that end up on site for the, the, the builder to work from. Well, you have, it's the you know, architecture and design is a practice, just like with medicine. It's never done. It's iterative. Things improve. You change. You stand there. I mean, I, I'm sure you guys would agree that there's not been one project you've ever been on that you didn't reach a certain point. You stand somewhere going, you know, if we did this, it could be something really special. And unfortunately, on the other side, you stand, so you, you go to the same project like, yeah, that didn't really work. But that's why, you know, it's evolutionary. We keep moving along and we, we try to do things better and learn and create something new and, and exciting for our clients. And I, I, I want to get to the heart of this, Scott. <laughs> Brenton, I got, I got to get to the heart of this. Who takes responsibility, right? We've, we've spec, the designer has told, said uh, they've been given a budget, $10 million. I want to build a home for $10 million. And the designers begin to dream and they put something together. And then you've got to, uh, and you come back and you say that we can't do that for $10 million. That's going to take $15 million. And then if you make some change orders, it could get even worse. Who starts taking responsibility? And I'm going to say specifically for the economics of the project, because the, the designers and the architects um, are have a reputation for being dreamers, and the builder has the reputation for playing the heavy 
and coming in and saying, that's not possible, or that's going to cost too much. That's more than you think it is. So talk to me about the resp roles and responsibilities <clears throat> with respect to the economics. Yeah, you want that one? Uh, I'll, I'll start, and I'm sure we all have some opinions on this one that can uh, contribute in. It, it's, it is an iterative process. Um, you know, as, con as the builder, we're closer to the dollars. We understand that more, but it's still a dynamic business, um, a dynamic deal where, you know, what the prices were on the last house we did may or may not be totally relevant to this next house we're doing. And the devil's always in the details. And so as we get information from the designers, you're sort of doing a fire and adjust scenario for like artillery where it's like, okay, well, here's kind of what we're thinking. And the builders go, well, we kind of think it's in this sort of price range. And then hopefully the owner goes, okay, I'm comfortable with that. And then so you carry the design to the next level. And at the next level, we again, take another look at things and say, okay, well, the budget stayed about on track or wow, you guys really upgraded what the design is going to be. Or, you know, no, we're still a very comfortable zone. And you do that two or three different times so you don't end up having the, the design team. And I'm sure that um, that Mimi and um, Hillary have gone through this before too, that if you design out something all the way, you can occasionally end up with a really negative surprise in the budget. And then you have to go back and start over and no one's ever happy about a situation like that. I don't know, you, you guys thoughts? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely true. You need to have those financial discussions before you do anything. And that's really the key. You know, everyone needs to come to terms with the fact that, you know, nice stuff may cost a little bit more. And so you have the discussion and yes, it's, it's kind of the builder's responsibility to take on that financial responsibility, which sometimes, you know, people look at as well, you're maybe the bad guy, but look, it's just, it's just the reality of, Hey, we're telling you what it costs. We've got to, we, you know, if, if we're going to build this, then this is, this is what you have to agree to. So, well, so as you can process, imagine, go as ahead. you can imagine, we have a workaround for this too, because um, that's how <laughs> we are. We level up, level up, level up. So we saw this happen. It, it affects us the most in the end, you're going to build your house. You're not going to buy your couch. So, um, <laughs> you know, we've had to come up with a solution for that problem. And ours are extraordinarily detailed construction documents. So Britain can speak to this. Um, you know, an architect might send 20 pages and we're spending 120 pages because the amount of detail we put in before um, it even starts the project, it includes the kind of tile, where the tile goes, the lighting, what light, what light it is. And to, to get it into the construction document means we presented it to the client. So the client has seen every number before we even bid it out to builders so that they can control at least the finishes. And we ask builders not to include finishes only so that they can see true numbers for finishes. Because I think it is so hard as a builder to imagine what finish somebody's going to use. Like, I'm like, like you're just making it up out of your head. I don't know. I don't know how you guys do that. So we don't make anything up out of our head. We pick every tile, we pick every counter, we pick it all ahead of time. And we give extremely detailed Excel spreadsheets of every finish with their price that's going to go into the home before we start. Not that it won't change or evolve, but I just something to work from. Yeah, yeah I just am, and I also like lets the builder know, oh, like it's marble, not porcelain. Like that, there's a difference for them too when they're bidding a project. The more they know ahead of time, the truer you guys can be, which I feel like only reflects better on you at the end if you were numbers match up to the numbers you started with, that's going to make your client happier. So we feel like that's part of our partnership is really being very detailed with pricing. Is, is I, have a a hierarchy? So I have a client ahead. right now who uh, is in a little house and he wanted to expand his little house uh, for $3 million in New Canaan. And uh, he spent several hundred thousand dollars with a very good architect in town and when he went out to bid, the bids came back at $4 million. And he said, I'm not enjoying the process. It's gone up by 33%. And uh, I'm, I, I'm going to stop. I, I'm not enjoying the process. So, go f so I'm going to put my house on the market. And I'm going to go buy another house. I'm going to go buy the house I want. And he just shut down the project and bought another house. And I'm wondering, what could he have done 
differently to have avoided spending $300,000 on architectural plans before finding out that his project was going to cost him an extra million dollars. So I think that the thing that you want to do is you want to start to put the team together earlier. You want to bring that builder into the fold right away and create that partnership with the design and the build so that you can quantify things as you go. You know, But don't I want to bid it out to several? Don't I want to have my ducks in a row? You, you ultimately could do that. You could pay for pre-construction services so that, you know, you just pay me a certain fee and if I get the job, I'm going to write it off. But, you know, otherwise, if I don't get the job, I'm, you know, you're just going to pay me for my services. At least at that point, I can work off a rough schematic. You know, Scott, and I, Scott mentioned it's iterative. It is. You need to come up with like a preliminary design and then you need to validate that. And, and then that gives, you know, everybody the peace of mind that they can go to the next level and say, all right, well, it's actually 3 million or it's 2 million or it's really within that zone of where I want it to be. And then they can go to the next level and keep checking in. And if you don't do that, then it's really easy to say, oh, I want a big skylighter. Oh, I want, you know, extra square footage, or I want these kind of elaborate things. And then there's never this check and balance to say, hey, man, it actually costs more. But some of this of what you're talking about is pre-purchase. It, it, it's, well, it could be pre-purchase. Because in, because in John's situation, the guy bought it with a certain thing in mind, and then he yeah. got the reality, as opposed yeah. to having some sense of guidance prior where he may not have bought it at all. Well, here, here's like an example of what, what happens in the design process. I mean, the design process should be fun, should be exciting. I mean, it's a creative part. You're, you're making something of beauty. And the first time like a vanity shows up on a set of plans, it's this little rectangle. And everyone's go, great. Now as things go on, everyone goes, huh, I wonder if we actually did this as a, as a radius. And they go, okay, let's just put a radius there. So we're just doing a little line. Well, that just doubled the price. And then it becomes an elliptical. And it's not just the bottom part. Now we have the door that's elliptical. And then wouldn't it be great to put a little stone on it? Sure, that'd be awesome. And so we're talking about like this one little vanity thing. And through a couple of quick discussions without a price discipline, you went from a thousand to five thousand dollars. And you did that, by the way, on seven vanities. So that was thirty five thousand dollars that all of the discussion was maybe 10 minutes. And there's a thousand of those decisions. So if you don't have a somebody sitting there who's the the realist, as, as um, Brinton said, the realist is just, I'm just delivering information saying what you just did, just raise this. If you really like it, let's keep going here. But here's the cost implication. And without a cost control, the design can end up moving very quickly into something that, that gets out of control. With that in mind, just curious, I'm going back to what John said about who's responsible. Is there a hierarchy among these trades that we're looking at right here? Architect, builder, designer or who's in charge you know, here who's in like, charge who, like but when it when the rubber meets the road who who has more authority or is it does it come at different times like i would imagine like in a real estate transaction the broker's doing all the work up until you have a deal then you kind of then you bring in the mortgage broker or, or you have them during the process and then it gets handed over to the attorney the attorney kind of finishes the deal after, of course, you do board approval and all that type of thing. I would imagine architect for archi or designer, maybe architect and then builder at the end. There's they're kind of shifting like who's at the, who's at bat right now. You're on the same team, but like now you're up. Is that how it works? Like, yeah, I think it's about defining roles and responsibilities. You need you need all these different components, you know. You know, we're like very like very practical designers. So like we're we're laughing over here because we're like old. Okay, we're not young, we're not babies, we're not like 20 year olds with dreams. We're not, we're, we're not dreamers, dreamers that way. <laughs> right. like, crushed by life. Like, we are gonna plan it out. And we're, <laughs> when you have experience in what you're doing, we're gonna design the kids' bathroom different than we're gonna do the primary bathroom. The primary bathroom might be 200,000, but the kids is gonna be 75 or 50. You know what I mean? We know how to design a space according to what it should be in the budget. So when you hire people who are experienced, I think they're gonna give you that level of knowledge sooner than later also in our firm i am the mean one like hillary is I'm the dreamer, dreamer. <laughs> and i'm like you are joking me but you know sometimes it works like brenton and i just finished this beautiful pantry together and hillary's like what if the shelves in the pantry were stone and i'm like that's ridiculous i'm not even presenting it she's like oh we're presenting it and we did we presented it but we presented it with a price tag 
We didn't just say this should be stone. We said, this is what stone will cost you. This is what wood will cost you. The benefit of stone is the beauty and the durability. The benefit of the wood is it's less expensive and it will also be beautiful, but maybe not as crazy as stone shelves. And guess what? They went, they went with the stone shelves, didn't they, Brendan? They really did. They always do. They always do. <laughs> well, well, not always. Like we love to have yeah. options, you know? Yeah, and I think the answer comes back, Roberto, that it's the owner decides what priority where. And it's the team's responsibility to help fill in those roles. Because, I mean, look, if a project gets into economic difficulty, well, everyone's got to try to work to get the, the most uh, efficient use of the fund. Well, you should always be efficient in the use of the funds anyway, but then that becomes a priority. If the owner uh, you know, just got back from their vacation and they were in an Amman resort and they really love these certain details under the master bathroom in order to create a total retreat, well, design takes a priority on that, not the, um, not the cost. Now you have to have the cost realism, but who's leading in order to, to get to that next level to really you know, provide value for the client. And value is, is that combination that includes cost, but is not driven by cost. When, when the budget gets out of control, who notoriously takes the blame? The designer. Uh, Interesting. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If it's all something all pretty, if it's, it's something technical, yeah. but pretty, we take the blame. You know, what's interesting in jobs are, you know, John, I just keep thinking about your friend and I, I'm like, my heart breaks, you know, that is such a frustrating experience. And like, we have seen it over and over again. And, you know, I think there is this disconnect with architects who aren't working directly with builders that they just don't know how much things are. We just, we worked on a house that we adored in a town near us. Um, and the clients wanted to spend, I think, two millions on the bid. And the architect drew this amazing home. It was gorgeous. And it came in at four million. And they were like, this, th there's just no, there's nothing here that makes sense about this. And so they called their realtor and bought a house and we decorated that house for them. It wasn't designed because there wasn't much to do. It was more decorating yeah. of filling with furniture, but they also left their money on the table. And we kept saying like, walls of glass are beautiful. Do you know how much your windows are? Because we just finished a home on the water in Larchmont, New York, where the windows came in at over a million dollars. So we know that that is a thing that like, if you're gonna do walls of steel windows, you're paying for walls of steel windows. And Scott, I'm sure you have that experience too of and you too, Brenton, of having to tell them how much the windows cost. And like, I just, I think that there, there is this weird disconnect with architecture. And I think part of it is because they draw and leave and not many draw and stay and then end up seeing like how much things actually cost. And I get it, like, that's what it's become in the industry. And I'm sure, I, again, I just, that home in Larchmont, the architect was with us every single week talking through design decisions. So it's not across the board, but a lot of what we see is sort of architectures at the beginning. And then they, as you said, pass the baton. But if they pass the baton, they don't really know what happens next and what it costs their client next. Yeah. Scott Hobbs is known to have said, when do you want me to deliver the bad news? What did you mean by that, Scott Hobbs? <laughs> well, no, it, it's I've been asked before, where, where I'm sure that that everyone sat inside of meetings where a client, after you talk, this is the first time you've met them. They describe the house, and then they go ahead and they ask the question. It's like, so how much do you think that'll cost? Now, the reality is, we're six months to a year from even being able to provide any sort of an educated guess on that. But of course, I think everybody knows that that person is not hoping for a really big number. That's not what they're hoping for. And odds are that no matter what number I say, it's probably going to be more than what they're going to be comfortable with. Probably. And so I sometimes will sit there and I'll ask, it's like, well, when do you really want to know, when do you want to know the real answer to that question? And knowing, you know, smart clients will then laugh because they realize it's ridiculous to be asking that at this point. Because what they're really asking is they're asking us to go ahead and put something that's somewhat of a lower type number that'll make them feel good. We don't do that because you know, we end up providing a range, not necessarily even at that point, but a range. But it's just sort of like, look, th this is the kind of in the area that I think this is heading. But you know, we don't even know what a square foot is yet. You I mean, might not win the assignment, though. 
Well, all that honesty probably costs you a few assignments. <laughs> which I mean, oh my God, talk to us about that. That's not good for business, Scott, or is it? it? It's much better for business than telling a low number and spending the next three years trying to go ahead and explain why every time you show up, you're asking for more money. I mean, if you're in it for the long haul, I think it pays off. You just tell them straight because then your reputation comes around, et cetera. Yeah. I want to, I want to, but so I want to talk about the, uh, the team. What does that mean? Because I'm going to hit share screen and, and just show an example of what I'm talking about on the M Mimi and Hill website. You, I see that there are two principal designers, then there's five more designers, and then there's five project managers, a styling specialist an ordering specialist and a shop manager all working on the project. Is there any duplication? Is this the most efficient? Is that is that A, is that typical? And B, does Scott Hobbs also have a project manager? And Brenton, do you also have project managers? And and what is their role? Start with design. We 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 balance our company on checks and balances. So it's not like every nobody doesn't work in their own tunnel. We're all like cross checking each other so so typically yeah. hiller and i run every job overall but there's no, typically one designer per job there aren't multiple designers per job and there's typically one project manager per job um we rely on each other but um it's not like all five project managers are working at the same time on britain's job it was actually our construction specialist not even our project manager that worked on on the jobs that he was on because you know we wanted to really impress him um, <laughs> so, um, we, there is not a lot of overlap and we work hard to make sure we're as streamlined as possible, but we're fast, like we're fast as anything. And, and I think Brenton can speak to that. Like the second something needs to be revised, it comes to him the next day, basically. Like we're not, we are fast on our feet. And that is really important to us. Like we are people pleasers at heart and not just our clients, but our traits. So that's why our team is so deep. We do take on a lot of jobs in order to have the team we have. That's a choice we've made. We don't keep to like one or two jobs a year. We have more than that because not all of our jobs need all of our attention and need, and not every job needs the kind of experience some jobs need versus other jobs. Like a ki one kitchen is not the same mm -hmm. as a full house. Talk to me, Britton, about what that's what that looks like on the ground. I mean, are we meeting weekly? Who's in the meeting? And yeah. how do we keep this thing on track? Absolutely. We've got to meet weekly. We've got to have the, the homeowner, the designer, hopefully the architect, project manager, myself. <clears throat> you've got to have that consistency. Obviously, you've got one-off meetings, but you've got to have on the books a regular meeting where everyone can come together and kind of press the flesh and, and uh, just look at the project and, and catch up and be on the same page. And you have a big Gantt chart of what the next 18 months looks like for this major project. And when the those meetings start to slip because clients aren't making timely decisions, that affects the roofer, that affects the plumber, that affects all the other trades. It's your job to say, of course, you're slipping and it's going to cost us money. 100%. And I think, you know, with that, right, obviously the, the, the schedule always moves. You, you, you try to hit your deadline and ultimately you do hopefully hit that deadline. But in between you, you're always kind of playing catch up with certain things. Take some things, take longer, some things you kind of catch up on. You know, you have a project manager on site who drives that schedule, but then you've got to be communicating constantly with the client to manage the expectation because there's just inherently this sense of anxiety where they're spending a lot of money and they just, they just need to know all the time about as much as possible what's happening did our clients need that Britain? i'm curious like i all need that yeah because oh. we had we <laughs> had clients that like were so like so happy to not know anything like on from our end like we dealt with issues and problems all the time behind their back and solve problems on site and we didn't even tell them because they're two extremely busy executives and with three young kids and couldn't keep up with their life and so there was just so many things we were like, let's just get it done. They don't even need to know. So this changed slightly, that's fine. Like they'll met, like, and not trying to be like tricky, more protecting their mental health and the mental load of carrying these big builds constantly. I feel like that's what our project managers are so good at, yours and ours, kind of 
connecting yeah. and solving and moving on. <laughs> yeah, those, those were seamless because we worked well together and we all managed their expectation. I think it's, it's a, a key aspect is trying to go ahead and, and as we tell our clients, I mean, there's 10,000 decisions that have to be made to build this house. You can't concentrate on all of them. You've hired great professionals. Let us worry about a lot of these. But if there's something that's really important to you, and we're, by the way, we're going to ask you a lot of questions to find out what is important. I mean, is it the HVAC system and making sure they never get a puff of air as they're sitting in their favorite chair, you know, from a, a non-variable speed air handler? Is it, uh, you know, the cabinet hardware? Is that something that just really is exciting to you? And focus on those things and let us be your advisors and really help lead you on the other things. Because if you try, I mean, we've had clients that have tried to really dig in on all 10,000. And that's just, it's untenable for anybody. I mean, we all just go crazy on that. It doesn't work. So can we talk about the differentiation of the approaches that you guys take? Because that's one of the things that was the basis of this show. And there's obviously there's things that happen in sequence in order to bring every project together. But what, so what's different about how you guys work? My, my guess is that we actually all have some similar, we have probably more similarities than differences. Um, I, I think under the title of the show, which is doing design build versus um, a more conventional split approach is who you're bringing to the table and, and what those roles are. And, and for, I'd say the more traditional approach, I always point out that this becomes sort of a three-legged stool. Now, the reality is that there's actually about eight legs to the stool, but primarily you have an architect, a builder and an owner. And those three legs work together where the architect uh, or the design team provides that um, the aesthetic, the concept, the, the design, the flash, plus the actual construction documents. The contractor provides sort of the reality side of things under, is it feasible to build it this way? Will this actually last and hold up? Architect actually is responsible for structural things, but then the builder says, can you really build it the way it's conceived of? And then we have price and schedule. And then the owner fulfills that third role of saying, okay, am I more concerned about schedule, more concerned about budget? How do I align these things together to create the most value for myself? And with a good team, you have a creative tension that we're all competing against each other. Uh, not competing against each other. We're competing for the best project, to create the best project. So if you have a design team that just folds to the builder, then you're going to probably end up with a mediocre house. If you have a builder that folds to a dreamy design team, you're going to have a lot of warranty and, and probably a blow up in the budget and the schedule. And so somewhere in there, we need to sort of, you know, we need to be trading back and forth on each other to say, what is the best practice? What will achieve the best thing here? Have you thought about this? And again, a lot of trade off, a lot of communication, looking for a, a superior outcome. That's a great way to describe it. <laughs> I, would, I would absolutely agree with that. That balance that Scott just described is really crucial for success. So if you take, that's the traditional model. If you go to the design build model, you know, you take one of those legs out and you just don't have the same balance and check, right? So if the, if the architect is the builder, it's really hard to do both those things well. And I just don't know. I mean, if you're doing it in a speculative basis, sure. But if you're working on a custom basis for, for a client, it's, it's hard to be successful and really deliver the best of, of design and build together. I, that's All right. This is a good segue I, for me to introduce Pete, Pete Mikulski of Wadia <laughs> and Associates, master of the one-legged stool. Pete, why don't you tell us about design, build, and why? <laughs> let, let me let me set Pete up with one big okay, set him up. <laughs> the, the, the construction industry with architects, builders, a whole lot of other, there's a difference between high performing and mediocre to low performing. And if you got a mediocre to low performing, trying to combine it and put it all together in something that's better, it makes a lot of sense. If you have high performing players, then you have more options. But having like a mediocre design team and a mediocre builder together. That doesn't that doesn't result well, and 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 a good design build team will do far better than mediocre sets of separate people. So this is the kind of thing that uh, Pete's team has to build over at Wadia. So tell us, tell us, Pete, how do you do it? So uh, quick quick bit here is that we consist of vertically integrated companies. 
So we're not necessarily against design build. Um, we are at our core an architectural business, but we have a construction business. We have an interior design business and a landscape business. That vertical integration allows us to actually control some of the process as we go through something. So before, when we're talking about, well, you can't have the architect be a builder, we are in fact that at times, and then other times we're not. That's really up to the client. So we what kind of client, what kind of client needs it all to be tightly integrated, which you can offer? What kind? I would imagine the ones who are time starved and don't want to be involved in the process. So ninety nine percent of our clients are ultra high net worth, which means they're thirty million plus. The houses that we build are anywhere from three million for renovation. We're working on three projects that are in the seventy million dollar range right now. So. Uh, those are the clients that they don't want to have to coordinate and, and basically become their own GC for a project. They want to have us manage the entire thing. But regardless, if, if we're not doing that and they choose to have another builder, then there's two things I'd say. One is that before, when you're talking about the drawings, we tend to almost overdraw. So you look at the shops, you look at everything else. It's very, very detailed um, how the tile is supposed to be laid out the spacing on the grout, all of those things. Um, that's really important to both us and the client in terms of how the final project's gonna look. The other component is when we're starting to, um, you know, put things together for the client, they wanna make sure that um, they're not having to monitor uh, all of the different partners in this. And, and what we really try and do, sorry, am I frozen? Um, I wanna make sure that uh, what we can do is, is deliver the best product all the way through the process. And what we didn't talk about at the beginning was client control. So nobody ever talks about that. But when you start a project, you have to say, these are the rules, this is how we're gonna play. And you're welcome to make changes as we go. But if we get all the way through schematic design and we're starting to do DD and we're starting to do interior elevations, and then you have an epiphany and you wanna change that, that's gonna have a big cost implication. So we have those discussions up front and it's how you establish trust. Hillary, who, who's the one specking how wide the grout is? Is that your job? Well, we are, but he, Scott, uh, Pete has a firm that has all the elements that you see here in one, which is amazing. You can't spec a, you can't spec a, you can't spec a grout until you know what no the tile, tile is. Because that's what just decides that decision. Yeah. So I I appreciate that Pete does that. That's amazing. But that means he also designed it. Yeah. So and he has an interior design part element to your firm, right? Yeah. And you have to provide that. You have to fill in that gap in the traditional project, right? You sit between architect who's not specking the grout, not picking the tile in many cases, and the builder who's already said, we've, we've allocated $100,000 for this bathroom. And you're sitting there between the allocation and the designer's vision. And you're saying, okay, then, then we're gonna be limited to these tiles and this uh, specification on grout. Is that how it works? You sit Are in you between- Are you talking to Pete or to us? Uh I'm I'm speaking to Hillary and me. Oh, are you, yeah, sorry. Are you in between. Oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Architect. He thought you were talking to Pete. So, listen. Pete's projects are the highest end that they could be, you know, at 30 million, 70 million dollars. Not everybody's project is that size. So, I don't know if everybody Neither goes are ours, by the way. <laughs> not all of them. But, you know, I not every every client is, has that capability of going to a firm that does all that. So I think that is one type of firm and one type of way of working. And, and we, I wouldn't ever bash how yeah, he's doing I'm like, his job. That sounds help? amazing. <laughs> um, that sounds great. Um, you know, you can't control costs the same way, obviously. Um, you kind of have to give up faith that like, it, I want this type of house, Pete builds this type of house, that's who I'm gonna use. I think the benefit of another way of doing it is being able to bid. So a good set of construction documents allows people to bid the project 
realistically. And I think the only way we try to educate our clients, the only way to have a true bid is to have the design really done up front with the architecture so that the bid process is real. That said, when you have a certain amount of money, like I might look at Britain or Scott and be like, that's my builder, people, like make it work, yeah. <laughs> you know? So that's another way to do it. And we've certainly been in that situation too, where we're not, it's not about bidding to, to different construction companies. It's about really making sure, you know, the team has a real concept of how much time things are going to take. Because, you know, when, when an architect draws a bathroom, they're not, typically not elevating every single wall in the bathroom. So all the all the builder sees is tile on the floor. When we're done with it, there might be tile on every single wall. Who knows, you know, but that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of what helps our builders allocate time and resources as well as really having as much of those decisions made up front, even before the build starts. So I don't know, did that help? <laughs> it, it, How yeah. many of your clients come to you and say, I have a budget? Um, every For client me? comes to us oh, and says, I have a budget. Pete. <laughs> oh, Pete. Uh, every client has a budget. They do. So, I mean, and, and you need to extract that at the beginning because if you're not having that conversation, then you're going to end up in a pretty precarious place later on. Yeah, I mean, it, there's problems that some clients think that they should hold that really close to their vest, and it just doesn't work for anybody. I mean, you, right. you, you got to bring it out. You got to be honest on it. You got to work through it. And and I, I think we've had one client that didn't have a budget and really meant it out of like 300 or so. And right. even there, I'm uncomfortable. It's like, even if you tell me that, I'm going to give you a budget because there, as we think we all know, there is no upper limit in the high-end construction business as to what you can spend. And I don't want to get to the end with something terrifying and you then all of a sudden determine you actually really did need a budget. That's not a good thing. We have about also, 10, your minutes, budget of, sorry, have your about budget 10 minutes left. So too. I want to make sure we get it all in there. Mm -hmm. What I've heard you say is that um, I should mm -hmm. begin the process maybe and engage Hillary and Mimi uh, and say, uh, help me uh, this is this is what I want to do, and here's my budget. And then you'll say, well, we should talk to these builders, maybe involve one or more of them up front in the process. Um, is, Which is they're that right? happy to do for us and an architect we give them so front. much work. Yeah, they'll walk through jobs with us all the time, you know, as favors to us. We'll say, can you just meet us? We want to understand if I take down this wall, am I blowing my client's budget or is this not a big deal? And they'll meet us on site before there's plans submitted, before you know we've, we've gone but down. What I hear you saying is that rather than start with an architect or start with a builder, start with us and talk to us about the way you want to live in the house. And we will, from, the, from an ergonomic and a how to live in the house point of view, will help you uh, may, uh, find the right builder because we know them all and we're agnostic and the right architect and help you through that process. Is that what I hear you saying? And sometimes they don't need an architect. We have an interior architect that's able to do all our interior work if we're not touching the outside of the house or building. Yeah. And we've, we've talked some people out of expanding. We've said, you have room here. Like you're crazy. Why would you expand? Like bigger is not better always. And so we've pulled jobs away from expanding and into more reworking interiors. But I don't want to say that we don't love working with architects because the more the merrier for us. We wouldn't have a yes. giant team. Oh, if come we didn't on, let's love bash some architects. Together. Let's have some fun bashing some architects. Scott Hobbs has told me that he has gotten plans from architects and looked at them and said, this is not buildable. This roof doesn't actually connect to that roof. I mean, you can't see it necessarily on their plans, but it's t tell us, Scott. Is that true, us, Scott? Me, Bryn, give me some horror stories about when wow. it doesn't work. Oh, it's, it's, I mean, the, the key, I think, to it from what we talked about earlier is, again, get high performing teams, get the right people involved. When you don't, that's when you actually, you know, I've come to the realization, and I'm sure others have too, that if any member of the team fails, it detracts from the overall customer experience which means that we've got to go ahead and raise our game and cover for them. Now, I'd much rather prefer not to have to do that. But I mean, like architects, for example, they have a prejudice against allocating any space for mechanical rooms. So you end up with like a 10,000 square foot house 
and you have a nine or 10 air handlers and the, the geothermal system and everything else, and we get 150 square feet in order to put all the mechanical stuff. I mean, if you literally got it- And what do you do? What do you say? We need this is crazy. We, I mean, I, I, like Britain, have you ever had a house where you sit there and you looked at the plans and said, wow, that's a generous amount of mechanical space. I mean, one out of 50. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's always tucked in the corner, not centrally located. So. Exactly. It's the far right-hand corner, and you got to make sure. it you know, 300 feet across. And then what about the specialty electronics closet? Where does and that the ducks, closet can be? No made? one ever thinks about the ducts ahead of time. Like, like that's yes. not drawn in. And right. so, like, the duct work changes the design completely. Completely. So I, I know ceiling it, details on yeah. lower levels, it's it, tough. It, this all comes back to if you can put the right people together, good people in the beginning, you're going to have a successful project, right? And yeah. Have that balance, then everyone's going to really work together, play off each other. I, I built a building in the parking lot, 3,000 square feet, right? 1,500 per, per floor, flat roofed cube essentially i mean as simple as it could be glass all the way around 15 1500 feet on the second floor and they wanted to put the air conditioning unit and basically take up a third of the space and i said you can't do that well we we could put it up on the roof but that'll be ugly because it's a flat roof building and i was like yeah we're not doing that either you can't put it on the floor and you can't put it on the roof and you can't put it in the basement and they're like, and they're like, well, what do you want me to do? I want you to suspend it off the floor. I want you to tuck it up there in the ceiling where I can't see it, you know, and hide it. But I want you to put it on the seal, suspend it you from the ceiling. Sounds like an ideal client, John. <laughs> yeah. Wow, we're sorry we haven't worked with you. And now <laughs> it sounds like I could hire Mimi and Hill to to have that conversation for me next time. It shouldn't it shouldn't come to me to tell. Well, my that architect. is that is the benefit is our clients really don't have to have the hard conversations with the builders as much as like on the small things. Obviously, like our the builders we adore are the builders you'd want to have those conversations with clearly but to be able to not have to have every conversation is a luxury and that's the luxury we afford our clients so that there's tons of things that our project manager Jess and his project manager Mark talked about that Britain and I don't even know about you know what I mean? <laughs> because there's there's just so many details that go into into a job that you know yes uh, you know and speaking of architects Britain and I just finished a job working with one of the best architects in our area. And we basically both threw away the plans. Like the, they look nothing like the original plans. We changed the entire interior layout once we really got to know the client and got to know like what they wanted their kitchen to look like. He How just drew it. How long did that take before the time where you started and then you threw it all away and came up with round two? Is that three months, six months? Or is that yeah, all? so happening? fast. No. It was like a month. Not two weeks, months. Maybe a couple of weeks. So yeah. let, let me ask you a question. I, I, in, in New York, there's, there's so often you have to renovate an apartment when you're looking for it, okay? And the clients are always like, you know, I just need to have some idea of what it's going to cost to do this. You know, whether, you know, I literally saw a 7,000 square but foot no apartment really yesterday. Wants and it's to a know. big number. No Am I bringing? really wants to know. <laughs> but hang on, no, but what I want to know is who should, and they want to say, can you find someone who can come and meet us at the apartment and give us some idea? Am I calling an architect? Am I calling a designer? Am I calling a builder? Who am I bringing if I'm bringing one person to give them a sense? Pete. I, I'm going to say that I think it's market dependent. I know this is going to sound strange, but in Palm Beach, for example, um, a lot of people have a long-term relationship with their interior designer. Uh, the interior designer spends more time with the wife, who's generally a, more of a decision maker on the ground. Um, and when they begin a project, they may bring in the architect and they may collectively decide who they're going to use. Um, they may also take recommendations for a builder. Whereas in like Greenwich or in Hudson Valley or something like that, they may start with the architect because the architect's going to start to talk to them about program, which is what uh, Mimi and, and her team are talking to the clients about, which is how do you want to live in this space? What does it look like to you? How do you want the light to come in in the morning? You know, what is your day like? Um, how do you want to move through the house? How do you want your kids to move through the house? Tell me about what a typical day is like. There's a lot of Manhattan. things you have to discover in that. I'm sorry. And in Manhattan? 
In Manhattan, it's generally dictated by the space. Um, and a lot of that is also depending on, you've got a building architect, which becomes sort of the final arbiter of certain decisions because yeah. it's the building architect. So if you're in like the San Remo or other places where we've worked, um, they're the ones who are gonna make certain calls, but we're gonna do all the interior uh, design. So all the interior elevations and so on are drawn out, you know, down to whatever profile we're using and specific knives that we used and all the other things. Well, I think Roberto, for your specific question and everyone comment on this one, I think if you're, if, if this is, is a decision upon if you're going to build or not, if, sorry, if you're going to buy it or not, and you need a quick answer, you probably need a brute force answer. And that's probably the contractor where it's just, I'm looking over here or here's the problems, here's the other issues. But that then, then at, if you decide to do it, then you almost immediately want to go toward the architect because the builder didn't answer that question as to what's possible, what do you really need, all the things that Pete just brought up under how you're going to live in the house and do things. And then you want to, again, combine those together. But I mean, I think- for, I will say in Manhattan, though, you might not even, the designer might have seen a lot. We see all the project bids for our clients because we compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. So we show them on all the bids who forgot this, who remembered this, why there's why there's a difference. So we had really eyes on the ground on who, how much things cost because we see, see the bids. More. I don't know if you builders ever see our bids. Yeah. Or a competitor's bid. Normally by mistake. <laughs> you wanna hear something crazy about costs? There's, I was looking at an alteration agreement for a building today. After 90 days of construction, they charge you $1,000 a day. After 120 days, they charge you $1,500 a day. After 150 days, they charge you $2,500 a day. And after the, the six month mark, they charge you $5,000 a day. And, and that's if why- you have a two, If you have a two year renovation, that's nearly $2 million in fees. And that, and those, that building probably has reduced um, prices for whatever the units are. And certainly you end up getting a premium if you have a done unit. Because I mean, that's a real lot of sand in the gears. That's a ton of sand in the gears. No. So the, the approach of a lot of contractors is they go in, they demo, and they stop the clock. They go off, they make their designs, they see what everything is, they build as much as they can off site, they come back for like 30 days, ta -ta 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 -ta, and they stop again, and then they come back. All right, we're almost done. I want to give each of the six of you a chance to tell us what you learned today. But before that, I want to say thank you to all of my fantastic guests for joining us today on Burrows and Burbs. I want to, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to click the share button in your podcast app and send this to a friend. Go ahead. I'll wait. Your support helps Roberto and I eat, reach even more listeners and grow this Bros and Burbs community. Uh, and we're not done just yet. Please take a moment to review our show on your favorite podcast platform. We're, uh, our biggest platform is Apple, but I think Google is right behind. And your feedback is invaluable and will help us continue to improve and bring you the content you love. Um, and with that, let me turn it over to you. What did you learn today? Uh, our parting words, Hillary, Mimi. I mean, for us, we love being collaborative. So hearing what you guys, what's important to you, we always are gonna go back to our team and say, this is what they said. And it's information, collaboration, and really being honest and team players together. We had fun, thanks for including us. <laughs> Britton, what's the takeaway for today? What, what's, the, what's the secret to a successful project? Well, first, thank you for including me. It's been a pleasure and a lot of fun. Um, I, um, I think you gotta, you really gotta put that team together early. I just, I think it's so critical. Um, everybody's gotta be pulling their weight and, uh, and working together. And if you, if you feel like, that team works, that team will work throughout. If you realize in the beginning that that team isn't working and you've got a weak link, that's probably not the right team. Yep. Pete, Pete what do you got for me? Over communicate. Um, it may, you know, when you feel like you're over communicating, you're probably doing just enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and Scott, uh, honest collaboration with good people. 
get a great team and work with that team and, and try to create something better than, than the individual members can do alone. And Love start that. with your builder before you hire an architect? <laughs> always, always. <laughs> I thought you might say that. Well, thank you all. Remember, share it, like it, um, and, uh, and tell all your friends, because this was a great episode, and I hope more people get, learn about uh, the design and build and decorating process from uh, all of you on Burroughs and Burbs. Thank you all. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Roberto, right. did you learn anything? All right, great job. All clear. <laughs>